Hello, bravs. Since I got no response to my asking which ghost story I should read for The Haunted Homestead by Eden Southworth, I am going short and reading a brief ghost story from Michigan Haunts and Hauntings by Marion Kuklo, who was a practicing witch who lived in Michigan all of her life. And we will go to chapter five, poltergeists. Most dictionaries defined a poltergeist as a noisy or mischievous ghost. This is not accurate. A ghost is an entity, a separate and distinct being. When a ghost haunts, it is usually with a purpose and usually because it wants to communicate with the living. A poltergeist, on the other hand, is not a separate entity with a purpose of its own. And although it may cause a lot of noise and action, it does not really communicate. It is, in effect, the result of human energy. Let me explain. All humans, whether or not they realize it, possess a certain amount of kinetic power that can be used to move objects without touching them. This is sometimes referred to as psychokinesis or teleportation. With practice, many people can develop and control this power, enabling them to make a hanging object such as a mobile, a mobile, a pendulum lamp, or a hanging plant sway or move in a circular pattern without touching it. Groups of people working together, as in a seance, for example, can produce energies that unite and seem to take on a personality of their own. A witch's cone of power is an excellent example but you need not be a witch to have this power. A simple seance often produces it without the presence or involvement of spirits. A group of people sits around the table with everyone's hands on top so that each person's little finger touches his or her neighbors and their hands form an unbroken chain. Lights are dimmed to make it easier for the participants to concentrate. If all members of the group do concentrate, it is possible for them to work up energy that is so electric that it can be felt by others. In the room outside the circle, often tables rock, wrap, tip, and even seem to jump about the room of their own accord. I have seen seances in which the participants had to stand up, leave their chairs, and follow the table to avoid breaking the circle. Once movement starts, light can be turned up. People can laugh and talk, and nothing short of breaking the circle seems to stop the action. Such action is the product of human energies, not spirits. Although not consciously, the members of a circle are providing the energy that moves the table. A poltergeist is an unpremeditated release of energy. Geez, from what... A poltergeist is an un premeditated release of energy of this sort. It can be produced by just one person or a combination of energies from more than one. The people causing this energy release are unaware that they are responsible and usually believe they are being visited by a ghost. Interestingly, poltergeist activity often occurs in households with teenagers. This is not difficult to understand. Teenagers are more likely to be frustrated and anxious than nearly any other group, due in part to the biological changes taking place in their bodies and to the way we as adults are treating them. First, we tell them that they are no longer children and that they should and act grown up. Then, when they try to emulate adult behavior, we tell them they are not old enough and they are still children. If a teen openly reacts and vents his anger by talking back, slamming doors, and so on, there is little likelihood of trouble with a poltergeist. It is when the young person represses anger that his or her pent-up frustrations can cause the kinetic energy that gives rise to the havoc. Then everyone becomes frightened and believes there is a ghost in the house. The following story covered by the Detroit News, the Detroit Free Press, the National Enquirer, and the Mellis newspaper from 1970 to 72 is an excellent example of the phenomenon. The Lincoln Park Poltergeist. The McMasters family lived a quiet life in a quiet neighborhood in the Detroit suburb of Lincoln Park. Doris McMasters, mind you, all the names in these stories are generally changed by Gundella. 
since I'm familiar with her work, was the dominating member of the family. Crippled by a leg problem, she did little to help herself, depending totally on her husband and son, who catered to her every wish. Walter, her husband, was an extremely handsome man, but one with no spark of enthusiasm about anything. It was as if he had long since lost all hope for excitement, any excitement in his life. His daily routine consisted of getting up, going to work at the Ford factory, coming back home in the evening and sitting with the rest of the family, usually watching television until it was time for bed. He had once enjoyed bowling, but when his wife could no longer go out, it seemed unfair for him to do so. So he had quit bowling. Their son, Larry, had quit school at age 16 to stay home and take care of his mother. Larry was a big boy, very docile and quite friendly, but his lifestyle was certainly not that of an average young man. At the age of 19, when his family's story finally became known, he had never driven a car or had a date. He had no friends his own age, and his only outings were weekly shopping trips with his father to the supermarket. His daily activities consisted mainly of cleaning, cooking, keeping house, waiting on his mother, and watching television. His only hobby was stamp collecting. One winter evening, while the family was sitting in the living room, they heard a sharp crack and found that a cue stick lying on the pool table in the adjacent, adjacent recreation room had broken in two. It was winter, they reasoned, and perhaps the dry heat and lack of humidity had caused this freak accident. But the following night, there was another incident. Again, they were sitting quietly, Larry reading a book while his father and mother played cards. Suddenly, magazines that had been stacked neatly on the coffee table flew up and scattered about the room. No door or window had been opened, and no draft had entered the room. Certainly no human hand had caused them to fly about. The McMasters became understandably upset. They believed their house to be haunted, and what was to follow certainly strengthened this feeling. In the next several weeks, doors would open and close by themselves. The toilet would flush when no one was in the bathroom, and inanimate objects took on lives of their own, moving about from place to place. The McMasters mentioned these things to no one and quickly and quietly put their house up for sale. It was soon sold, and the family moved into another house just a few blocks away. But the McMasters soon realized that they had not outrun their problem, and their new home, just as in the one they had left, lights flickered off and on, rocking chairs rocked with no one in them, and weird thumps and bumps could be heard at all hours of the day and night. Around that time, both major Detroit newspapers featured columns designed to help readers solve problems of all sorts. The column in the Detroit News called Contact 10 was handled by a panel of 10 writers and advisors. The Detroit Free Press column was Action Line. Readers could call or write either of these to seek help with unusual situations. The McMasters first called Action Line. The Free Press called me asking me to accompany the reporter covering the case when she visited the McMasters in their home. After talking at length with all three members of the family, I came to the conclusion that what was troubling them was not a ghost, but a poltergeist, and carefully explained to them the difference. They refused to believe this and begged me to perform an exorcism. When I said that I felt it would be a waste of time since there was no ghost to begin with, they implored me to do it anyway. I discussed the matter with two psychologists from Wayne State University. Both felt that if such a ritual were enacted and the McMasters believed in it, it might possibly serve to lay their ghost to rest. I had my doubts, but since it would do no harm, I decided to go through with it. At the appointed time, I arrived at the house in Lincoln Park. Mr. and Mrs. McMasters, their son Larry, and the free press reporter were all assembled in the living room to observe the ceremony. I began to bless the house with earth, air, fire, and water, according to the tradition. Halfway through the procedure, there was sudden pandemonium. Doors began slamming all through the house, clattering, clanging, and rattling from all directions. Worry and buzzing sounds filled the air and grew louder and louder. Mrs. McMasters began screaming. Her husband tried to comfort her, and Larry threw up. The free press reporter rushed out of the house. To her credit, she returned a few minutes later, saying she had gone outdoors to see what might be going on out there to account for the noise. When the ritual was completed and things had quieted down, 
The McMasters seemed to be very pleased. They were certain that everything was now all right, and the house had been rid of its evil spirits. I still had my doubts, and time proved me correct. Nothing unusual occurred during the next two months. But ten weeks after the exorcism, thumpings, bumpings, and weird happenings once again began to plague the McMaster's family. This time they called Contact 10. The Detroit News called in experts from Duke University in North Carolina. After investigating the phenomenon, they too felt that it was not a ghost but a poltergeist causing all the commotion, and that it was the result of the frustrations and anxieties of the people who lived in the house. They suggested that if Larry were allowed to go back to school, join the service, or in some other way get back into the mainstream of life with others his own age, the whole matter might well be solved. Mr. and Mrs. McMasters refused to accept this view and would not permit Larry to leave home since they felt he was needed to care for his mother. When therapy for Mrs. McMasters was suggested so that she could learn to do more for herself in, this, in spite of her handicap, the idea was also scorned. When last heard of, the McMasters family was still living as they had been before their troubles began and still believed they were being haunted. All right, that's goodbye. That's goodbye time. Goodbye.